Huh. It's it's great to see everybody inside their homes and where they've been uh, cooped up for the last so many months. Uh, in a f several days, we're going to be heading into the yellow phase, which means that it's no longer mandatory that you have to shelter at home. Um, and that uh, some of the restrictions are going to be uh, changed uh, and uh, and groups of 25, uh, up to 25 can gather. Uh, social distancing and is, is still going on, so there's uh, regulations going with that, but uh, there's at least some, some freedoms that are gonna be coming forward very soon. And, uh, and with those freedoms, which I hope everybody exercises responsibility because you know, the threat is still there. Um, and we want to continue to keep things uh, as far as how many people are exposed to this and deaths and everything, hoping that that can continue to, to decline and, and stay down. Uh, right now, also something going on that, I, that everybody's been exposed to is uh, the George Floyd death, um, a murder uh, for, by a police officer caught on film that's just basically ignited people who are uh, of color and who are oppressed uh, all across the country. And there's all kinds of demonstrations and protests. And um, there's a lot going on right now in our country. And uh, and we need to, we definitely need to keep that in our prayers. And we also need to come to the aid of those who, um, who, who are uh, the, on the victim side or the, the victim of injustice. Um, as Christians, we're supposed to, to help those, those types of people. Um, and it's 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 heartbreaking what happened and um and i'm hoping that it this will cause some sort of reform in the country with with how uh law officers interact with people of color and people in general um so i, I <clears throat> i'm not sure exactly um what that might look like but i'm hoping that something will happen and I'm hoping that that uh, at w when all this dust settles, that there will be a much more peaceful and uh, and unified country. It seems like there's a lot of uh, discord <laughs> even before that happened. Thank you, everybody. Um, so today, our lesson is is encouraging one another, encouraging one another. That is an essential part of community and an especially, and especially the community of uh, <clears throat> the fellowship of, of believers. Uh, when I think of encouraging, one of the, uh, one of the times that I believe I was most encouraged and this is this comes up in my mind whenever I'm I might not feel be feeling uh, worthy in some kind of way or up to a task. I haven't shared this story too often, but when I was in high school, uh, I did I did well my first year in ninth grade. Uh, my second year in tenth grade, though, we started heading downhill. I became disillusioned with school. Um, and was not, uh, I kind of, kind of gave up on working hard at my schoolwork. Uh, and I, I ended up past, you know, I, I passed ninth grade, passed 10th grade. And then, uh, well, actually, sorry, I, I went through 10th grade and then I didn't pass 10th grade. I ended up staying back a year. And the way they handled that in my high school was, in ninth grade, I was in room 310. 
uh, with the people in my class, with all the people in the, the class of 1995. The, the second year I was in class in homeroom 310 until I fouled at the end of the year. And then they moved me to a different homeroom with a class that was class of 1996. And so they moved me into to homeroom 210. I was in homeroom 310 uh, with the class of 1995, my original class. The homeroom teacher, her name was Miss Maholland. She was a, a really nice woman. I didn't have her for any classes. I just had her for homeroom. But when I would see her in the hallway, I would say hi. I might say a couple words to her here and there. And so I, and when I stayed back and I got moved homerooms for two years, um, and, I, and I moved into room, homeroom 210, I had a different homeroom teacher, but I would still keep in touch with Ms. Maholland. Um, after a little while, I realized I, I need to change things, and I wanted to graduate with my original class, the class of 1995. And I talked to administrators and that required me not taking lunch and taking classes instead. And, um, and I, had to, I had to, there was a lot that I had to do in order to make that happen. And I worked hard and I did it. And along the way, I would mention to Ms. Mulholland, yeah, I'm, I'm, going to be in, I'm going to be in your homeroom again, watch it. I'm going to be in your homeroom again. And, and she was like, yeah, just keep working hard and you'll be able to do it. Well, I did it. Um, I, I ended up being moved back into homeroom 310 for the last week of the year, or sorry, the last two days of the school year. And, um, and Miss Mulholland, she gave a gift to everybody who was in her homeroom that she had made months prior. These were keychains with the kids' initials inscribed in them. And she handed me a keychain with my initials inscribed in it. She, she, she knew that I was trying to graduate with the class um, and she believed in me enough that she purchased this keychain and had it ready for me. And she said, I knew you could do it. That really encouraged me. Um, that encouraged me deeply. And, and I carried that keychain around with me until it was basically um, my initials weren't even on it anymore, and it was, it, 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 I put it away in another spot now, just, I take it out and, and think about it once in a while, but uh, encouragement is something that we all need, and we all uh, need to give and offer one another. Uh, community is, again, I wanted to highlight this because the focus here is on community. And, and encouraging one another is part of this community. So community is fellowship with others based in the care and value for one another and potentially a commonality. And encouraging one another is a characteristic of God and God does expect it from his image bearers. So what, what does it mean to encourage one another? Let's take a look at what Hebrews chapter 10 verses 25, 24 to 25 says. It says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I like that, uh, I, I like how this is phrased in, in the very beginning here. Encouraging one another is to stir up one another to love and good works. That is, that is the purpose of encouraging someone. Whenever encourage or exhort is mentioned in the New Testament, it's primarily derived from the Greek word Palakalau. And let's take a look at that word. It's a compound word of para, para or pata, and kalau, which is uh, alongside pata and kalau to call. You see, you parallel, you know, it's alongside. That's where, you know, 
the Greek word pata come, comes in. So alongside and karao, uh, to call. This is a very rich word. It evokes uh, five different meanings for, for the Greeks at the time. One meaning is to rekindle a flame or to stoke a fire. Uh, Palakaleo uh, visualized someone gently and patiently blowing on dying embers to bring a fire back to life again or to uh, make the flames grow. And you, you can see this when you encourage someone. Uh, there's usually a reason. You, you want to you want what uh, you want what they're doing to continue to grow, um, and there might be something specific that that you want someone to do that you need to encourage or get get the flames going within them. This is a really good visualization when you encourage somebody. This picture blowing on uh, some glowing embers, trying to get a flame. Another is to call forth comfort. Uh, Palakalau uh, visualized the cries of a frightened child in the night, calling for comfort and reassurance from his father. Just picture that in your mind as you encourage somebody who uh, might, might be uh, scared or frightened or completely discouraged, uh, lacking uh, some, some sort of uh, safety and you want to call comfort into their lives. And so you encourage them, you encourage them in that way. It also uh, is visualize someone injured and calling for a physician to set his broken bone or bind a wound. Um, there is an encouragement for, for physical, physical healing. Uh, another, another thing to visualize was uh, uh, Palakaleo uh, visualized the military officer who in the heat of battle could calmly encourage and exhort uh, the, and steady the frightened soldiers in his ranks. This is so true um, with us in the faith that we are, you know, think about the, the pastors um, constantly trying to embolden and encourage uh, the, the believers in the church to live out the gospel and to share the gospel um, and not shrink in and, and stay in your spot, but to go out and share God's love. Uh, it, can be, it can be scary, that, uh, uh, but, but this, <laughs> this encouraging encouragement to go out and, and live out the faith is something that is critical. And, and you see this uh, you can envision this many times uh, throughout the epistles as Paul is speaking to, um, speak, speaking to the churches. Uh, you could also see it uh, throughout Scripture, <clears throat> God getting people ready for the heat of battle, not necessarily battle, although in the Old Testament, you know, that <laughs> legitimately battle sometimes, but, um, but, but going out and being his light in the world, being the salt of the world, and uh, having his believers do that. And in others, and another uh, visualization of this word is uh, counsel for the defense, you know, making an appeal before a client, uh, for his client, before a judge. Uh, there, th these are the ways um, that Palakala, that Palakala, Palakaleo uh, really uh, illustrates as far as this word for encouragement. And, and so we're looking at rekindle a flame or stoke a fire, to call forth comfort, to call a physician, to stabilize the troops, to plead one's case. You know, God set an example by encouraging people all throughout his narrative. And so we're going to take a look at Exodus chapter 3 verses chapter 3 through chapter 4 verse 17. Just to give you some background here, uh, Moses was an orphan 
who, you know, he was, uh, his, he was found in the, in the river by uh, Pharaoh's daughter and taken in and uh, basically adopted into the house of Pharaoh. Um, and, but he was always someone who was not born into the family. He, uh, at one point, saw a, a Hebrew being beaten by an Egyptian, and he murdered the, uh, the Egyptian and buried him in the sand, and he, he, thinking that maybe nobody saw it, but apparently people did see it, and the word got out, and Pharaoh was very angry, and Moses became a refugee, <clears throat> and he ran from the land, and so uh, and he found it fell upon a priest, um, priest's daughters, and uh, and they brought him back to the family, and um, he became basically part of the family. Married one of the priest's daughters, and um, and so here, uh, the that priest's name was Jethro, and here is where we're picking up in the story. I picked this because th this is a story where you really see God as an encourager. And Moses is almost a worst case scenario for someone you're trying to encourage. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you can encourage somebody and it's like, man, how much do I need to encourage this person? Um, so let, I will start, I'll, I'll, I'll read most of this here for you. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that through the bush, that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called him forth from within the bush. Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have indeed seen, indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. Now, mind you, um, Moses was very much a witness to this, and he even killed one of those Egyptian slave drivers. So Moses is, this, this hits home for Moses. So God goes on, so I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. <clears throat> so the story should pretty much end right here with Moses going, right? <laughs> As he says, so now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. You know, a confident person would be like, yeah, all right, I'm on my way, <laughs> ready to go. But, um, but that's not what happens. God says go, but then uh, Moses stops. He says, he says to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? So he's questioning himself. Who am I that I should go and do this? Clearly has an issue with his confidence. And God said, I will be with you. And this will be a sign to you. 
that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. So, so first, I, I just want to point out, so, so now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. <clears throat> this is a command, but God is choosing Moses out of everybody in the entire world. God is choosing Moses. And the fact that God is choosing him should be encouraging to Moses. That, that is, when you get chosen, it's an encouraging thing. When, um, when, when I think Drake mentioned about getting picked, um, when, when doing sports, you, you're picking teams, like when you were younger, and you know, you get up against the wall and pick this person, pick that person. Drake mentioned this, I think, in uh, was one of his devotionals. Um, so just picture that right here. When, when you get picked, it's an, when you get picked first, it's, you get chosen, it's, it's encouraging. Wow, yeah, I got picked. Um, you feel encouraged. So, so here God encourages Moses by choosing him. And then here, when Moses said, who am I that I should go? God encourages him by saying, I will be with you. God's, pre God's saying, my presence will be with you. So, so God's presence is an encouragement. He's encouraging Moses by being present with him. So here in verse 13, Moses says to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent, sent me to you. And they ask me, well, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? So Moses is, is <laughs> he's still not feeling confident. He, you know, well, what if this happens? And they ask me this. So God <clears throat> says to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you were to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So, so uh, God also says to Moses, then say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. And then he goes even further. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Then he says, go assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what you have done, what, what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt, into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. So God here encourages Moses by giving him the answers. He tells him what to say. Well, all right, you're worried about them asking that. I'll tell you what to say. Here are the, here are the answers, Moses. So he encourages Moses by giving him all of the answers. And then he goes on. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I'll stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. So, um, so here we have in this paragraph, 18 to 20, the elders of Israel will listen to you. God, another encouragement. God assures Moses, that the elders of Israel, they will listen to you. And then another encouragement, the biggest problem, the, the, the huge crushing army of Egypt, you know, well, how are we going to be able to, to go out and worship and do these things? Um, God says, I will take care of that. I will take care of the biggest problem. So God encourages Moses again by saying, I will take on the biggest problem. You don't have to worry about that. 
He goes on saying, and I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed towards this people, so that when you leave, you will not go empty handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any living woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters. And so you will plunder the Egyptians. So here is another encouragement. You will receive riches. <laughs> the encouragement continues. The, God's encouragement to Moses continues. You will receive riches. But it goes on. It goes on. At that point, you'd think Moses said, all right, I'm ready to go. But that's not what happens. Chapter 4, verse 1. Then Moses answered, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say the Lord did not appear to you. So the, this Moses has some clear confidence issues, and he's, he needs the Lord's hand of encouragement. And the Lord said to Moses, what is that in your hand? He said, a staff. <clears throat> and he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. And so he put out his hand and caught it. And it became a staff in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. And so he put his hand back inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. If they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. And the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. So <clears throat> God encourages Moses by giving him these special abilities that he's given like him a magic, like he's turned his staff into a magical staff that can turn into a snake and then back into a staff. And, and that he can stick his hand in his cloak and pull it out leprous, put it back in and take it back out and it's healed and normal. And also that he could take water from the Nile, put it on the ground and it looks like blood. These are some pretty incredible, uh, um, you know, <laughs> powers that he's given him. And so, and, and there's more powers that go along with it. You would think, wow, all right, I'm ready to go. But no, Moses still needs more encouragement. But Moses said to the Lord, oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and tongue. And then the Lord said to him, well, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, therefore, go, and I will be your mouth and teach you what to speak. So God gives him assurance that even though he doesn't speak eloquently, the God of, of voices, of speech, will make him speak eloquently. You would think that that would be enough. But no. Verse 13. But he said, Oh, my Lord. Please send someone else. After all that encouragement, he's, oh, please, Lord, send someone else. And then this is where uh, our patient God has uh, some anger come out. <clears throat> so then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, so his, his anger was kindled, okay, and yet he still goes on encouraging. And he says, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. 
Behold, he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. So now God gives Moses a partner and not just any partner, a partner who he assures him and encourages him will be glad to see him. Aaron will be glad to see you. That, oh, all right. So, so more encouragement. So Moses, not only will God's presence be with Moses, but he will also have Aaron there as a partner who will be glad to see him. And he goes on to say about Aaron, he shall speak for you to the people and he shall be your mouth and you shall be as God to him and take in your hand this staff with which you shall do the signs. So last bit of encouragement. It's like, this, this is like, whoa. How much does God want to encourage Moses to the point where he's willing to give Moses the power of God over Aaron, his partner, and to give him what to say? God encouraged Moses by choosing him, by being present with him, by giving him the answers, by assuring him by taking care of the biggest problem, by promising him riches, by imparting special abilities upon him, by promising him that he would make him speak eloquently, by giving Moses a partner who will be glad to see him, and by giving Moses the power of God over his partner. If you look at at how God in in this you know some of the 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 verbs um, that are here in the encouragement that God gives He chooses Him chooses um, by being by giving by assuring by taking care um, by promising by giving um, and again assuring so. So these are ways of encouragement. Encouragement um, is, is listed in scripture as a spiritual gift. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 12, verses four to eight. Romans 12, four through eight. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Um, it says, let us use them if okay. prophecy in proportion to our faith. If service in our serving the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Um, I have these highlighted here, all right? Uh, these are mentioned as gifts. And there, it, this is kind of, might be, seem kind of peculiar to you because um, here we have uh, the first highlighted portion, if service in our serving. Well, um, service is something that uh, all Christians are, are called to do. Um, the next one is the one who teaches. Not everyone's necessarily called to teaching. Um, then you have the one who exhorts in his exhortation. That's encouragement. Um, the exhort, ex, exhorting is encouraging. And so we're, we're all supposed to do that one too. That's what we're learning about today. The next is the one who contributes in generosity. We're all, we're all called as followers of Christ to contribute and to be generous. Um, and so that, that's another one. And then here, acts of mercy. Uh, we're all called to be merciful 
to one another and to be merciful in our lives to others. And so um, it might seem kind of strange or peculiar that these are special, these are, these are mentioned as uh, spiritual gifts, but these are things that we're kind of commanded to do um, as Christians. And the thing, the, the thing is that if you go back um, to this, where, where God says, uh, uh, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Uh, say that again, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, that God um, will give certain people special gifts that they're able to, to execute and, and truly be exceptional in these particular areas. I know people who are, we're all, we all serve, we all have the capacity to serve. There are some people though, who they are truly gifted in serving and they have, uh, they have certain abilities that they can use to serve other people that, that, that's on a whole other level than me. And then uh, encouraging would fall into that same category. And then the one who contributes in generosity, there's some that have uh, way more resources to give. And so they're gifted in a way where they can give more than others. And then the one who does acts of mercy, uh, there are people in a position who, who, ha who, are, who have the ability to impart way more mercy than I can impart. Um, you think of a, a judge uh, uh, sitting on the bench. Um, he has way more capacity of, of dispersing mercy than I do. Uh, and you find that all around the board, those who, uh, who have more to give with regards to mercy, they, have, uh, they can have, potentially have a special gift as a Christian to impart a ton of mercy. So looking at it as a spiritual gift, all believers have the capacity to encourage and should encourage. Um, those with a greater portion of the spiritual gift of encouragement and exhortion have a heart burden to encourage and the emotional intelligence to do it effectively. Uh, I took a spiritual gifts test before and I was surprised because um, I, I, I never really even thought about encouragement as being a spiritual gift. And when I took this test, I scored very high in encouragement. And, and it just clicked like that. That's why um, I have certain habits and why I have certain burdens. Uh, when, when I was in school, uh, I would be called a brown nose, even in seminary. They were calling me a brown nose, like joking around with me, um, because I would, I would go up to the professors and I would say, on occasion, I'm really impressed with the lesson that you put together here today. I know how much work that, that was put, time was put into that, and uh, I really got a lot out of it. I want to thank you for what you did. I have this, when I, I have this, this burden when I see certain things that I, it's almost like I can't say no to encouraging somebody. I have to do it. Um, and so, uh, I, you, some of you might have been on the receiving end of that at some point, but, um, but there are some that are even more encouraged uh, with this particular spiritual gift, and, and they know how to do it, they know when to do it, and um, however, everybody is called to do it, and, and you need, even if it's not easy for you to be an encourager, uh, you need to try and figure out how to do that and come out of your shell to be able to encourage. Let's take a look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 8 to 14. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that we, whether we are awake or, or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. I want to pause right there for a second. So even in the midst of this, 
you know, in the, in the previous part, you are the people of the day because he was talking about people of the night and the, the misdeeds that they do. But you are people of the light as believers of Christ. You are uh, people of the light. Um, and this is what you're meant for. Uh, you're, you're to put on faith and love as a breastplate, the hope of salvation as a helmet. God didn't appoint you to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through Jesus. And so um, he says, therefore, encourage one another, build each other up. So, so um, encouragement, building each other up. That's, that's another image that you have that you want one another to become greater than they are, greater than they are. And it's funny, I highlighted this, and he says, build each other up, just as in fact you were doing. So he doesn't say, he doesn't just leave it there. He says, just in fact as you were doing, he is encouraging them in that statement. Therefore, encourage, build each other up, just as you are doing. So yeah, we're doing that. Let's keep doing that. Um, it's an encouraging statement. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. So, so here we have what, like, who to encourage and, and how to encourage. He's saying, um, brothers and sisters, acknowledge those who work hard among you. So those who work hard among you, acknowledge them. And those who care for you in the Lord, encourage them. And those who admonish you, encourage them. You know, that one might sound pretty awful because admonish is to, to, um, to warn somebody or, uh, you know, you need to do this differently. Um, you need to change the way you're acting, uh, calling somebody out on something, uh, keeping them accountable. So admonishing, even though someone's admonishing, um, you want to encourage them, acknowledge them as doing something good. It says, hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. So all of these people who are who have your best interest in mind in what they're doing and to help you, you are to encourage them, hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work and what they're doing. And that's gonna help, help you to live in peace with one another. And we urge you brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but also strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Yes, yes, thank you. So 1 Thessalonians, um, we have here in, in our passage, those who, who do encourage and why? And, the, and uh, the one part we have, those who work hard, those who care for you in the Lord, those who admonish you. And it's not just, so you know, when it's admonish, it's not admonishing you, just someone who just constantly rags on you, but someone who is trying to um, bless you by warning you and guiding you in admonishment. So, and in, in encouraging these people who are doing this, you're creating a greater peace among the community. And then we have to encourage the disheartened. And the, the, um, the Greek word for disheartened here, uh, you can look at it, it looks like small courage, those who have little courage. So you wanna boost their courage, build them up, those who are disheartened. Um, you also wanna encourage the weak by, being, by helping them and encourage everyone by being patient with them. Everyone will be doing good for each other. That's why. If you're doing this, everyone will be doing good for each other and everyone else. Um, in a community, in a community, well, let, let me go back to, 
to, let, let me go to kids, okay, in school. If you look at kids in school, they have a very difficult time when someone is succeeding and they aren't. Everybody in school, um, you, you will find, are trying to build, each, build themselves up and tear other people down. It's hard for them to encourage and build somebody else up because they themselves want to be built up. And so, and so, uh, and it's not just like that in school, that carries with people throughout their lives, but it's something that they're not taught when they're younger. It, it is a victory to be in somebody's life and encourage them and build them up into someone successful. And, um, and we don't look at it like that. We're the ones who want to be the successful one. So we need, to, we need to pull them down. We need to discourage. We need to bring them down to our level. That's not the case. If we are encouraging one another, whether we are those who are working hard and, and building each other up in the Lord, or if we're those who are disheartened or weak in small courage, if we are building each other up, everybody is growing into success and, and good is happening and being done. If there is discouraging to try and destroy someone or take them down a number of pegs for no particularly good reason, what good is that? because you're doing a disservice to yourself by doing it, and you're doing a disservice to that person. Instead, we want to continue to build each other up and encourage one another. Um, characteristics of an effective encourager include compassion and empathy, putting yourself in someone else's shoes and, and seeing where they're at, and understanding where they're at and when they need to be encouraged. Um, that is really important uh, to have that compassion and that empathy. Awareness, just, just having awareness of what's going on around you. If there is something worth encouraging and how to encourage, uh, that all plays into the awareness factor. It might be good to encourage somebody in a different way than the way that they'd received encouragement through this. Like words uh, were good, but now they need some encouragement by, by maybe uh, me coming alongside and being fully present with them. Um, being aware, and so that helps you to be a more effective encourager. Action. Actually doing it. <laughs> you don't want to just sit back on your laurels and, um, and just let life pass by around you. Even if you aren't someone who's been getting encouraged, find yourself going out to encourage somebody else because that will enable you to grow. You want to engage in action. God, the disciples, um, throughout scripture, uh, there was action going on. They encouraged through action. Uh, selfless motivation. We don't want to encourage somebody because we are trying to get something out of them, that we're trying to manipulate them in some sort of way. We want to do it because we love God, we want them to grow closer to God, and we want them to be successful in everything that they do and become better in everything that they do. So selfless motivation is really important. And then being genuine and sincere. Um, uh, Bob Russell tells about a story. He was at a, a conference, and he was speaking at this conference. He's, he, Bob Russell is a preacher, and he was also doing a book that's kind of led some of the series. Uh, but he was preaching at a conference, and um, there was a woman who got up and sang uh, worship at a particular point in the service, and she wasn't necessarily very good. Uh, the choir director afterwards uh, went up to Bob and was talking with him and they were having a conversation and the woman who sang came walking by. The choir director stopped, went to the woman and made a big show how wonderful that was. Uh, you, you sang beautifully, that was great. And then uh, she went by and she was smiling, she felt good about herself and the choir director went back to Bob in their conversation and he did a side um, saying to Bob, that really wasn't very good, was it? 
and kind of like a wink, wink. And, um, and then he said to Bob, and hey, I really enjoyed your message. <laughs> so um, that wasn't very sincere. And, and you need to be genuine and sincere in your encouraging. You don't just want to throw empty, uh, manipulative encouragement out there for someone. You want to be genuine and sincere when you're talking about it. You want to be truthful and authentic. Some final things to note with regards to our lesson. There are various ways to provide encouragement for one another. Words, telling somebody um, in, in, uh, that you appreciate what they've done, that they've done well. Um, and, uh, and so using words is really good. And it's probably the easiest. Uh, letters writing something down to just encourage someone in their every day. I've received, I've received lots of letters from people at church that have truly lifted me up and encouraged me. And I have an email folder from emails that I've gotten that I, I go into once in a while when I'm not feeling really great about myself or I'm feeling down. I also have a, a, a physical folder with cards in it and other letters that I've received from congregation members that truly lift me up. And I hope that you all have letters or something that represents encouragement to you that will lift you up. Uh, being present with one another. Uh, be, your presence is an encouraging thing. Gifts. Receiving some sort of a gift. Like I mentioned in the beginning of this, I received that gift from uh, Miss Mulholland that told me that she believed in me. And so... Uh, that was, gifts can be a real encourager. Uh, helping someone is encouraging. Uh, giving information to someone, helping them with information, that's encouraging. Assurance, reassurance, being patient. These are all encouraging things and there's so much more. God is an encourager. God the Father encourages. The old, throughout the Old Testament, you see his encouragement. We just read uh, from Exodus, and, and you can see God and, and how persistent he is with his encouragement of Moses. And if you even look at the New Testament, when Jesus gets baptized, the voice of God the Father comes down from heaven. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. That's encouraging. It's encouraging. And so uh, God the Father is an encourager. Jesus encourages. He rewards faith. Uh, he touches lepers. How encouraging must that be? A leper who's <clears throat> probably never been touched in like five years. Jesus comes up to him and puts his hand on him <laughs> and then heals him. Uh, that, that's encouraging to just, just have someone... Uh, touch you when you haven't been touched in a million years. Uh, not a million years, but five years. It seems like a million. And uh, Jesus empowers the disciples uh, by encouraging them and, and by giving him the powers that he imparted on them. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the, the, uh, the pure akletos, the pure akletos, uh, that's uh, obviously a Greek word. Uh, it's the encourager, the comforter, the consoler. All things that Jesus was to his disciples when he was physically present on earth, the Holy Spirit is to us in his church right now. And it is clear in scripture that God has called you, his image bearers, to emulate him and encourage one another in Christian community, especially in the faith, in things of the faith, and continuing his mission. So, encourage one another. Anybody have any, um, anything you want to add to this, or any questions? Now I understand better why you have been personally so encouraging to me. <laughs> you, you've been really very encouraging, and more than most people, and that now I see why. <laughs> so, thank you. 
<laughs> You're welcome. It, it is an odd thing because there'll be, there'll be times where it's a real burden on my heart if I don't have an opportunity to go up to a particular person in a particular time to say something to them, and it'll be on my mind constantly. And, uh, and Gail, you know, that's, you're the recipient of, of some of that. <laughs> I, know, so, I know many of you have that particular gift as well. Well, that's my gift. So I guess, I guess it resonates. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Gentlemen, I think this lesson uh, dovetails very nicely with last week's lesson about taking on someone's burden by encouraging people, um, especially the, the initial description of the Greek word. There were several of those items that were definitely taking on someone's burden, position and so forth. So a uh, nice dovetail with that previous lesson. Uh, one other thing I'll just throw in. Um, a lot of times I'm on the phone with tech support people or you know, customer service people and so forth. And I always just naturally say to them afterwards, th and not just thank you, but I appreciate it. And I think those three words, um, I, I noticed a definite response from the uh, customer support representative on the other line when I just say those simple three words, I appreciate it. And you, you some, we sometimes forget those are human beings on the other line doing yeah. a job. And so um, to let them know that you appreciated what they're doing instead of uh, um, just dismissing it like, yeah, that's great. Yes, I was just going to mention that in terms of encouraging the Bible study that I, the small group study that I've been involved in over the last, I guess, three years now. Um, has just really been encouraging to me. A wonderful, a wonderful addition to our church. I just think everyone get involved in small group. I just think it's great. Very encouraging. Thank you. That's great. And we and that's one of the things we want to do. We want to encourage people to get involved. Um, to be to, to to get involved in our studies. To get involved in church and, and what's going on here in the activities um, because that encouragement is encouraging people to be discipled and be discipled through these programs and I'm very thankful that uh, that you have that group there Chris that um, encourages you and disciples you you know just before we go off um, I just had a really neat experience this week I don't know where it came from but um, Oh, I guess it was from one of the morning shows. If any of you have time, there's a woman by the name of Brené Brown. And um, she does her work on uh, vulnerability. And she spoke to the University of Texas this week for their graduation speech. And if you have time to go on YouTube and listen to it, it's uh, about encouragement. But she puts her own unique on it about how when, we be, when we're able to be vulnerable to each other, uh, what you gain from that by being able to be vulnerable. So if you have time, listen to it this week. It's really, it's very encouraging, it's what it is. Thank you, Thank you Chris. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everybody. And I have an announcement before you, everybody goes. Uh, uh, two things. Uh, we have uh, Zoom offerings uh, throughout the week. Uh, Wednesday uh, lunch, uh, we'll look at the prophet Jonah. Thursday evening, there's a study at seven o'clock. Uh, there are men's and women's studies uh, throughout the week. And then, of course, we'll be back here next Sunday. Uh, we apologize for the link that came out on one of our emails uh, uh, this week that may have redirected you to, the, um, to a previous service. Uh, but the May 31st service is up on our YouTube channel and is up on our uh, Facebook page and hope that you've been able to take advantage of it or will take advantage of it uh, later today. It's, it's Pentecost and so prepare elements. There is a communion aspect to the, the service. Yep. Um, so grape juice or wine and bread. Uh, also, if you have any kids or, you know, who are young adults, we have a young adult dessert and devotions on Wednesday nights. It's a lot of fun. And uh, we've been, been been having a great time getting to know the Lord better through that. And that's at uh, 830 on Wednesday nights. You can um, 
uh, find information about that on the church website too, or you can email me if, if you need anything with that.